Hey y'all, so uh, for this chapter of The Black Hole, if you hadn't guessed by the uh, title over here, I really can't work well with chroma key. Anyway, um, uh, we're going to be doing this live, and uh, basically, just like you saw now, uh, a lot of this is actually going to be me making mistakes and uh, having to clear my throat and all that garbage. So I'm going to try and do any throat clearing away from the uh, mic, that kind of thing. So you'll hopefully uh, still get plenty out of this. And uh, I will make a lot of mistakes. Usually in the recording process, I pause, go back, stop recording, uh, do all these things so that the recording is as good as humanly possible. If there's a noise outside, for example, that uh, interrupts things like uh, a police car or something like that. Because I do not do this in... Uh, a uh, studio environment. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, uh, so anyway, I've got some fancy lighting rigs here, uh, but uh, this uh, particular uh, reading is being... Uh, I'm going to try and put some links below for uh, charity purposes so you can donate uh, to uh, some charities, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, that'll just um, make this all the better video for you. Um, the viewer. Uh, anyway, so far in the book, we have uh, the crew of the Palomino finding uh, a ship in the center of a giant black hole, which is essentially like a maelstrom or a whirlpool in space. And they aren't sure how this ship is uh, sitting there in uh, you know, at, at the very near event horizon, which is like the point of no return for a black hole. And uh, the uh, ship profile matches the profile of a ship that was lost featuring uh, one of the crew's father aboard. Uh, our, our crew of the Palomino includes a reporter, a young and brilliant scientist, a uh, telepathic uh, scientist as well, and uh, the uh, two officers, the two crew, um, which include a young hotshot pilot and an older, more experienced captain. And of course, a cute little robot. And uh, during the recording, just as now, I'll, just as in the first uh, episode, I'm going to try and emulate the celebrity actor voices that uh, did things way back in the day when this uh, came out as a movie. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so the Black Hole, Chapter 2. Pizer was making no attempt to restrain his own excitement. It stemmed from a similar yet different source than Durant's. I've read about the Cygnus since I was a kid, Dan, he was telling Holland rambling on in his disjointedly as rambling on as disjointedly as the adolescent to whom he had just referred she's sort of the flying dutchman of space the dream ship every explorer imagines himself finding and we've found her holland permitted himself a slight smile get us close enough pizer continued and vincent and i can go aboard her on tethers Surprisingly, the anticipated admonition came not from the man, but from the machine. To quote Cicero, Vincent began, Rashness is the characteristic of youth, prudence that of mellowed age, and discretion the better part of valor. The robot regarded the first officer. It would be best not to rush headlong into possible danger until we have a better idea of what happened. Yeah, sure, of course, Pizer suddenly frowned, looked up from the control console. Cicero who? Vincent made a noise that passed for mechanical choking. Pizer was rescued from the robot's response by the appearance of McRae and the sound of Booth speaking through the intercom system. We have to go in, Captain, the reporter was saying. No sense leaving the story of a lifetime untold. I'm more afraid of that black hole. Sorry. 
I'm more afraid of that black hole, that distortion of normal, healthy space, than any of you. But I'd go into hell itself in search of grist for a story of my listeners. If we get caught by that gravitational field, Harry, Holland replied, that's all we'll be, grist. Super dense grist. So I happen to think there is a reason for leaving the story of a lifetime untold. It's looking right at us, and vice versa. I'm not going into hell after a story, nor is anyone else on this ship. But Captain! Holland flipped him off. By which they mean the... The screen not actually yeah okay turn to his first officer picking up anything on the sensors charlie any response yet to vincent's calls pizer stared glumly at his readouts negative but with all that electromagnetic turbulence out there the signal might not be getting through or it's possible someone on the cygnus is receiving and their reply isn't reaching us their signal might be weak if their own broadcast circuitry isn't operating at full efficiency. It could be diluted or scattered by the stuff around us beyond our ability to sort it out. The ether is alive from 10 to the 21st hertz all the way down through radio. One thing we can assume, though, we have to. What's that? That their radiation shielding's intact. Otherwise, anyone left aboard alive would have been cooked as soon as they entered this region, just by the gamma radiation alone. My God, McCrae finally murmured, breaking her silence and staring at the screen. All these years of waiting and wondering of the authorities being able to do no more than shrug when asked about the fate of the Cygnus and her people? And there she is. The answer to all those mysteries and rumors. She looked from the screen to Holland. Damn? I know how you must feel, Kate, but that ship's hanging on the edge of a whirlpool to nothingness. We can't take the chance. We can't risk. At least check with Alex, she was pleading, knowing that the physicist's opinion would carry more weight than her own, which Holland was rightly bound to regard as hostage to emotion. All right, he spoke into the comm pickup. Alex, have you been listening in? Haven't missed a word, Dan, came the prompt reply. Tell me something that'll convince me it's safe for us to take a closer look. Give me a good, solid, non-humanitarian reason for doing so. Durant had been busy integrating information from the Palomino's long-range scanners. I can do it with one observation, Dan. According to our instrumentation, the Cygnus hasn't moved an iota since we first detected it. You're positive? Absolutely. Its position relative to the nearby star is unvarying. It's not in orbit around either the star or the collapsar. She's just sitting there. Holland considered. That's crazy, Alex. If it's not orbiting the star and its drive isn't functioning, and I can tell that it's not from our readouts up here, then the ship should be reacting at least marginally to the effect of the gravity well. You sure she hasn't been put in a functional orbit around it? Sorry, Dan. Durant sounded apologetic. She's not orbiting anything. Might as well not be a black hole there for all the effect it seems to be having on her. Or not having on her. It's almost as if she's somehow managed to anchor herself to a point in space, or found some way to negate gravitational forces other than by pushing against them with her drive. If it's safe for the Cygnus, we can assume until shown otherwise that it's safe for the Palomino. You're stretching supposition, Alex. I am totally messing that up. If it's safe for the Cygnus, we can assume until shown otherwise that it's safe for the Palomino. You're stretching supposition, Alex. She had the characters reversed, sorry. Maybe, but I don't have any explanation for her stability. 
just the fact that she is. How could a lifeless derelict, Booth put in, defy that kind of steady gravitational pull? If her engines aren't functioning, she ought to be sliding down into the well. I don't know how she's doing it, but that's reason enough for investigating her. Durant directed his voice back to the pickup. I totally messed that one up, too. I'll just keep going. That's my main reason for advising a closer look, Dan. If the Cygnus can somehow negate gravity waves without using a drive, it's incumbent on us to try to find out how she's doing it. And Harry, we don't know that she's lifeless. Not showing her lights or a drive isn't sufficient evidence of lifelessness. Well, she looks lifeless, Booth harumphed. It could be a natural phenomenon, Alex, said Holland. I know that. That's equally worthy of investigation. No, no, you're missing my point, Alex. The captain stared indecisively at his instruments. The Cygnus may not be frozen in space voluntarily. With a sun on one side of her and a massive black hole on the other, there's enough electromagnetic perturbations running through her, through here, to do funny things to the fabric of space. Space isn't nylon, Dan. Durant sounded impatient. You know what I'm getting at. If it is a natural phenomenon, we might find ourselves unable to break free of its influence. The Cygnus may be sitting where she is because she has no choice. Pull alongside her and the same effect might trap us out here also. Durant knew he couldn't just ignore Holland's hypothesis. All right, let's do this. As scientific leader of this mission, I formally advise carrying out a closer inspection. We'll have all our standard grav wave instrumentation primed to alert us as the instant any kind of gravitational abnormality is detected. I'll program corollary scanners for backup. At the first hint that anything bizarre is affecting us, we'll maximize the drive and move clear. Holland's thoughts were still on the side of caution. I don't know. It came down to the fact that the ship and crew were his responsibility. Even though at such moments he was supposed to follow Durant's and McRae's directives. It might be an instantaneous effect. We might not be able to break free no matter how quickly we detect something out of the ordinary. Now you're trying to overrule me on the basis of an implied dangerous effect for which we have no supporting hard evidence. We're preparing to return home. Let's take this one last risk, and then it'll all be over except for collecting our back pay. We've been gifted the chance to answer an awful lot of old questions about the Cygnus, about her mission, and about inconsistencies in gravity field theory that have plagued physicists since Einstein. There's no telling when another ship might get out this way, and by that time the Cygnus may be swallowed up. Holland weighed all the evidence and all the arguments. My instincts are still against it, Alex. <sighs> Maybe, but that's hardly sound scientific grounds for not investigating more closely. I know, I know, Holland grumbled a little, then flipped off the holographier. I don't know how to pronounce that. Holographier, holographier. Nudged other controls. All right, you get your electronic eyes and ears tuned proper, and we'll go in for a closer look. We'll have to go in at an angle, or we'll chance being taken by the gravity well. Maybe the Cygnus isn't affected by it, but I have to assume the Palomino will be. We'll do a tight commentary and get out. He turned his full attention to the console in front of him, spoke to his first officer without turning. Fix a coordinate approach, Charlie. We'll pass as slow as we can so Alex and Kate can take ample readings, but I want a reasonable margin of thrust programmed in. If we lose too much velocity in passing, we won't get a chance to make it up. Gotta love the techno babble, guys. He patted his stomach, grinned tightly. I'd like to lose a few centimeters off my waistline, but not that way. Right, sir.
The captain's cautionary attitude hadn't dampened Pizer's enthusiasm for the investigation, but he was subdued by the seriousness of the attempt. He hadn't been recommended to be first officer of the Palomino solely on the basis of his infectiously cheerful personality. Coordinate heading 305X, 275Y, 177Z. Pizer's fingers danced over contact switches. Computer verifies. That'll give us 15% extra if we need it. Adequate. Holland entered the coordinates into the navigation block, activated the necessary instrumentation for attitude adjustment. The Palomino shifted silently in space, pointing toward destruction instead of away from it. Attitude set. Engines ready, Pizer replied. Vincent, give us full power on our sublights. Yes, Captain. Connected by umbilical armature to the main console, the robot communicated instructions to power. Useless above light speed, the ship's powerful conventional thrusters engaged, and she began to accelerate forward. Several minutes passed as they continued to gain speed. Then there was a jolt, expected but still a shock, a physical reminder of the unseen immensity they would have to flirt so carefully with. McRae braced herself against the sides of the portal leading into the lab. Durant was adjusting the restraints on his lounge. Better strap yourselves in. The well will intensify as we near the Cygnus. Turbulence could get worse. Nothing's certain in there. Booth was already making certain his own restraints were secured. I thought the pull would be steady, growing constantly and without variance. It does, Durant explained while securing a last strap over his waist. That isn't contradicted by the turbulence. Partly it derives from the huge quantity of gas, solar plasma, and other material being drawn down into the hole. And there are likely to be other effects. Gravity around a black hole, like other things, doesn't act in a manner we're accustomed to. As if to support his comments, another jolt rocked the ship. Think of us as a gnat trying to bell a cat, McRae added. We're safe from the irresistible strength of the cat, but its snores will still affect us. I see. Booth glanced speculatively out the nearby port. The trick is to do the job and slip away without waking it up, or else. We get swallowed, McRae finished for him. But the Cygnus hasn't been swallowed. Another unseen hand shoved at the Palomino, harder this time. The crew became introspective, each considering the overriding mystery posed by the Cygnus's typo, by the Cygnus's seeming stability in the face of irresistible forces. Why hadn't the giant research ship vanished, crushed out of normal space by the strength of the black hole? They would have to employ the full power of the Palomino merely to skim the edge of the Collapsar's area of influence. The gnat was defying the awakened cat's strength. It made no sense, no sense at all but they would somehow have to find the answer. Makes sense from the information the ship's scanners would provide as they raced past. Pizer studied the constantly shifting display. Sorry. Pizer studied the constantly shifting display on the main navigational screen. Lines changed patiently, twisting a cat's cradle around the central growing image of the motionless Cygnus. Range 29516 and closing. I have no idea what those numbers mean. Thrusters operating smoothly. No problems. What's your reading on the Cygnus's attitude, Vincent? Holland tried to glance around so he could see the robot, but his chair restraints restricted his movement. Still holding steady, sir. Position relative to the star? constant, most remarkable. Holland's stomach seemed to drop half a meter as external gravity played havoc with the Palomino's internal system. Yeah, he finally replied, regaining 
his visceral equilibrium. Most remarkable. I'll find time to admire the situation properly when remarkably we're in the clear again. Gravitational reading? 2.47 on the stress scale and rising. Rate of rise also increasing, sir. The restraints still gave Holland enough freedom of movement to shake his head. He was worried. That's not good. With that much additional pull, we'll go by too fast to do any good. He demanded information from the ship's computer. Accepted it, along with the machine's several suggestions. Change course. Put us in an altered escape angle 175 perpendicular to the axis of maximum attraction. Compensate by cutting thrust two-thirds. We'll still maintain original projected escape velocity at perihelion. But I want constant monitoring of our revised course. If we deviate too much, don't hit it just right. We're going to have a devil of a time breaking clear. The Palomino continued to arc in toward the amazingly stable Cygnus. Turbulence grew worse. The strain was reflected in the faces of the pilots. The buffeting of their ship was matched by emotional turbulence within. One particular bad jolt shook them. Pizer felt the impression of his restraints all over his body. She's bucking like a bronco, he mumbled. Wishing he were back in Texas, Nat, dealing with more manageable varieties of turbulence. You could reason with a horse. Gravity. Gravity report, Mr. Pizer. Holland repeatedly, repeated sharply when his first officer failed to respond at once. No time for daydreaming now. Sorry, sir. Pizer devoted full attention to the proper readouts. All thoughts of radical forms of equine displacement forgotten. 20.96. And still climbing. He wondered how long it would be before the gauge broke. Like the Palomino, it was designed to withstand considerable forces. The ship had performed surveys of several Jovian-type worlds, handling multiple gravities and methane storms with equal equanimity. The perversion of nature they were teasing now, however, was to the gravity of Jupiter as a pebble was to a mountain. Holland continued to watch his instruments apprehensively. If they could count on a steady pull from the black hole, the ship's navigation computer would pull them through without difficulty. But as the turbulence they continued to experience was proving, the region of space they were now passing through was subject to gravitational and electromagnetic variations outside the experiences programmed into the Palomino's brain. They might be forced to maneuver suddenly and radically, might have to take risks no machine operating solely on logic and predisposition based on prior navigational experience would take. It was therefore time to engage the ship's ultimate navigational programmer, the only one on board that could cope with the unexpected dangers the bizarre distortion of space outside might thrust on them. Switching to manual, Holland said matter-of-factly, touching buttons in sequence on the console in front of him. A metal arm decorated with switches and buttons popped out of the console. He felt unreasonably better now that he was personally in control of the ship's movement. A reaction common to all pilots of all vessels since the dawn of transportation. Captain? Yes, Vincent. Permit me to elucidate a concern, sir? Go ahead and elucidate. I'm not sure how long the engines will remain operable against this much attractive force when we turn outward again. They are quite capable of producing the thrust necessary to carry us clear, but it is their durability under such conditions that concerns me. Even a brief loss of power could prove disastrous, and we cannot engage the superlight drive this close to a sun, not to mention that it might what it might do to the Cygnus. I know all that, Vincent. I merely reiterate, sir, because of the thought that Dr. Alex and Dr. Kate will be displeased with anything short of a thorough inspection of the Cygnus and whatever strange force is holding it steady in its present location. Holland nodded, glanced momentarily at a particular gauge. It read no more than he had expected it to, but he still shook a little inside at the sight of the numbers 
he had never expected to see behind the transparent face of the readout. Holland here, he said toward the comm pickup. The gravity is close to the maximum we can cope with. Alex, I've tried to slow our speed at Perihelion as much as possible. Vincent has just expressed concern about the reliability of the engines under this kind of stress. We can afford one pass, but then we have to get the hell out. Isn't it possible, the scientist's voice intoned over the speaker, that we might one pass and that's it. I'll try to give you as much time as I can. Attend to your instruments, Alex. Let's make this one pass worth the effort. Coming up on target and slowing, sir, Pizer announced. Slow us a little more, Vincent, Holland ordered the robot. We'll risk passing with a 5% margin. As you wish, sir, but if I may be allowed to say, you may not. Yes, sir, the robot succeeded in conveying a distinct feeling of disapproval. We'll pass below her, sir. Pizer was dividing his gaze between the foreport and several readouts. Check. Ready on thrusters, Vincent. Standing by, sir. A vast, dark bulk hove into view. It thoroughly dominated the Palomino. The long, roughly rectangular shape bulged at the stern. Each of her eight drive exhausts were large enough to swallow the Palomino. She wore her gridwork skeleton externally, like an insect. She was one of mankind's greatest technological triumphs. Even in the darkness, Holland felt a shiver of excitement pass through him at the sight of the enormous vessel. What pilot wouldn't have given an eye to command such a behemoth? The Cygnus had been designed to carry out any imaginable scientific mission deep space exploration might require. Its research capabilities far outstripped those of a dozen ships the size of the Palomino. That those extensive facilities incorporated into the Cygnus's basic design might never be used was something a few gave thought to in the heady days of her planning and construction. She had been built to be completely self-supporting, able to recycle air and food and water for hundreds of years if necessary able to travel the length of the galaxy as long as the children's children of her original crew retained the knowledge to man her. That was a last-seen scenario, however. Her creators expected her to return her original crew to Earth. The concept of a ship capable of carrying on from generation to generation was an appealingly romantic one that served a useful propagandistic purpose, helping to clear the way come appropriations time, for vast expenditures of doubtful utility. She was armed, too. Huge sums spent to satisfy an appeal to xenophobic fears that no longer haunted mankind. In Holland's subsequent searches through space, no intelligent aliens, friendly or otherwise, had been encountered. But such fears had existed at the time of Cygnus's construction. So jingoistic elements had forced the installation of the great ship of the means of extermination, as well as of a revelation. Nothing like her had been built before. It was like nothing it was likely nothing like her would be built again, not when smaller, less costly vessels like the Palomino and her sister ships could do the same work and cover far greater reaches of space for the same expenditure of time and personnel. Nonetheless, she remained a monument to man's mastery of physical engineering and ability. She awed even so stolid a man as Holland by her sheer size and presence. Stand by with your scanners, Alex. We're going under her. I'll try to roll us after passage to give every instrument a chance to record, in case of any failures. Enormous metal members reached out toward the Palomino. They moved nearer, the little ship slipping toward silent supports, weighing hundreds of tons on Earth, weighing nothing here. And something utterly unexpected happened. The turbulence ceased. That was absolutely the last thing Holland would have imagined. Gravitational effects had to have been affected, or the sickness would not have been holding its position as it was. They were more than affected. 
they no longer were. He glanced incredulously over at his first officer. As he checked and rechecked the readouts on the console before him, Pizer displayed a dumbfounded look. Zero gravity. Nothing. There's evidence of artificial gravity in use on the Cygnus, but nothing from the black hole. According to sensors, it's exerting less pull on us now than a toy globe. That's impossible. What about the star? Same thing. Meaning nothing. Pizer told him. Reverse thrust. Vincent complied, and the Palomino slowed to a comparative crawl. Stand by. The phenomenon may be temporary. It was not. The Palomino sat driveless in space under the dark mass of the Cygnus like a chick huddled beneath its mother's protective wing. It was coasting now, drifting slowly forward. Ease on the thrusters now, Vincent. Take us around and upside her. Charlie? Man and machine moved to comply with the orders. Holland continued to examine his sensor readouts, still hardly believing what they told him. Smooth as glass, he muttered softly. Incredible and frightening, he told himself. Anything that could so utterly eliminate the kind of attractive power they had just passed through hinted at knowledge that could prove dangerous as well as benign. Voices drifted out at him from the speaker. It's like the eye of a hurricane. That was Kate's voice. What's happened, Alex? I can't imagine what's causing it. Neither can I, Durant confessed readily. As we suspected, a natural phenomenon or something generated from the Cygnus. Not a clue which it is so far. Look sharp. Holland could visualize Durant turning his full attention to the information that must be pouring into the lab from the external scanners and sensors. The Palomino drifted around the flank of the immense ship, curved up, and started to arc around to pass over it. Everyone was busy at his or her station. They were trying to solve a pair of mysteries. One, the absence of pull from the black hole, and two the existence of the ghost ship itself. McRae was overcome with personal frustration. She left the task of monitoring the incoming statistics to Durant. Slipping free of her chair, she moved to the port and found herself staring fixedly at the meters of metal sliding past behind them. Soon they would reach the end of their turn, come around to pass across the top side of the ship, her attitude was not very professional just then. It was very human. Durant addressed the pickup. Are you learning anything forward, Charlie? Nothing of a revealing nature has come in back here. And nothing abnormal and nothing abnormal up here, Alex, came the first officer's reply. Negative. Whatever's canceling out the gravitational pull hereabouts isn't interfering at all with the rest of the electromagnetic junk that's filling this section of space. There are a hundred thousand natural broadcasts flying around us. I can't punch anything through it, even this close. If there's anyone left to, on board capable of communicating, which I sincerely doubt, they've got the same problems if they're trying to reach us. There has to be someone alive on board, McRae thought fiercely. There has to be. It, it doesn't even have to be Dad. Just someone who can tell us what happened. To have come this close. Actually, to have found the long-lost Cygnus and not to learn what had happened to her would be intolerable. She insisted to herself that the reason for pursuing the investigation further was grounded soundly in science and not in personal emotions. But she knew it would be hard, if not impossible, to conceal her feelings from the rest of the crew, especially from Dan Holland. She wasn't at all sure she wanted to make the effort. The Palomino had passed beyond the Cygnus, began to curve back toward her. Bring us full around, Charlie. We'll try orbiting her forward. Then we'll check out the engines. 
And after that? After that, there's still no sign of life aboard? We'll see. Yes, sir. Pfizer concealed his impatience. Bring me around, sir. The Palomino's attitude thrusters fired. A violent tremor ran through the length of the ship, like a sudden chill. Then they were tumbling out of control away from the Cygnus. A small gauge in front of Holland jumped instantly from zero to eleven, then twelve. It continued rising toward unthinkable levels with terrifying rapidity. Gravity approaching... Gravity approaching maximum, Dan, Pizer shouted, fighting the panic in his guts. My God, Holland's gaze remained locked on the single critical readout. It's got us. That's the end of chapter two, folks. What'll happen next time? Well, you'll just have to check out the next episode, which will be chapter three. Anyway, in the meantime, uh, I hope you had a lot of fun. I know I did. So I'll uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.